Hello and welcome to Access Chat. We're delighted today to welcome Meilin Fung, who is one of the co-founders of the People Centred Internet. We featured PCI initiative a few months back with um, other uh, co-founder Vint Cerf, um, but it's now time to speak with Meilin. Meilin has a long and glorious history in the technology industry, has been doing all kinds of things, but um, some of the most notable things that you've been working on are around inclusion and around networks for bringing people together right from the very early days where you uh, were sort of instrumental in the creation of CRM with Siebel um, to the work that you're doing today with IEEE and uh, also World Economic Forum. So we're really excited to have you with us. It's uh, you know amazing work that you're doing and uh, it's a real honour for you, uh, for us to have you with us today. So thank you for joining us, Melin. I'm delighted to be here, Neil. And um, uh, this long, illustrious career is only going to be useful if we actually get stuff to happen. So. Yes, uh, absolutely. And we're all um, passionate about making stuff to happen. Although we are talking today, the idea behind us talking is to help galvanize people into action and bring people together to act as a catalyst for social inclusion. So yes. um, could you remind our audience about the people-centered internet and what the purpose is and, and the thinking behind it, please? Yes, so the people-centered internet wants to put humanity at the center of the internet because that was actually how it started. That was the original impetus. I'm just gonna go a little into the history just to make the point. The internet happened in spite of the UN, in spite of world governments, in spite of politicians. And it happened because in every country, individuals decided, wow, this is going to change people's lives and I must do this. And so we have to continue that quest and understand that this new thing still has the chance to change people's lives. But over the last 20 years, the general large institutions have come back in to pull it over to what they want to do. And we, the people, must bring it back to make the internet of the people, by the people, and for the people. And that is why we called it the people-centered internet because I suggested to Vint that we needed to have an internet of the people, by the people, and for the people. And he said, Melan, that's too long. Let's just call it people-centered internet. Excellent. Uh, that, and that's a really um, concise uh, description of the work that you're doing. I know that you're, you, you, there's, aside from the thinking behind it, there are some real projects that uh, you're already engaged in. Uh, particularly in, in terms of uh, helping in the rebuilding of Puerto Rico. So um, so if you could tell us a bit more about that kind of stuff, and then I'll, I'll hand over to Deborah because I know she's lined up with some questions too. It was very interesting for just uh, Puerto Rico was hit by two hurricanes um, that was the, probably the most devastating that has hit US territory. Um, uh, Hurricane um, Maria and Irma. Um, recently, we've just found out that the death toll from that is almost of the order of the 9-11 uh, deaths. And so FEMA had already indicated that this was the largest um, recovery that they would ever do, larger than Katrina. And so um, we were brought in by the RAND Corporation to write the digital recovery plan uh, under FEMA's oversight. And the, the digital recovery plan is just our attempt to put something together, to put forward to the people of Puerto Rico, the governor and the rest. Um, that recovery plan was actually put out for public comment um, at the end of July. And then um, things are rolling forward so that the recovery plan was written, the governor is now taking it forward, and things are going to be happening over the next couple of months. Um, it made me realize was the importance of building resilient community, that 
it's not as though Maria isn't going to happen again. Hurricane season starts every June in Puerto Rico. It just happened to be particularly bad last year. And so now what we need to do is actually create resilient communities. And that means everybody can be involved in making their community resilient. And there's room for everyone to play a role. And so what we did with the digital recovery plan is really say, we have to work at the community level. There has to be community leadership. Communities have to actually take charge of what they need to do for the special circumstances of the people in there. You know, who has diabetes? Who's deaf? Who cannot see? How do we actually take care of ourselves on an ongoing basis? And it's the people there who know best what needs to be done, and we need to integrate those thoughts, their perspective. No longer are we living in a top-down world, because in fact, the voices of everyone can be heard. But let's go beyond voices being heard. People can design their future. And so our digital recovery plan is about bringing the people of Puerto Rico into designing and creating their own resilient communities. Well, that, that is so powerful. And, and the, the thing that I'm very excited about that's happening and, um, and, and I'm proud that we're all part of this is that, you know, as we rebuild, you know, Puerto Rico and a lot of the others that were hit by Irma, um, Maria and Harvey last year, uh, it was, it, you know, and some people predict, you know, these violent storms to continue because the waters are heating up. The, the conditions that created last year are still here on, on our planet. And, and, you know, that's just this wonderful, messy planet that we live on. But I think the opportunity and one reason why we love the work that you are doing at the People Centered Internet um, and, and we and you, Maylin and Vint and David Bray. Um, is because it's not just about disabilities versus LGBT versus these diversity groups. This is about human beings. And human beings are these fragile people sometimes. You know, we sometimes you're born with a disability like my daughter. Sometimes you acquire a disability like my husband and my parents, and I'm sure myself in the future. And so what can we do, once again, to create resilient communities where and, and that was a good point you made too, where not only are our voices heard, but they're really heard, they're really listened to, and we become part of the solution. I think that's something that really attracts us to your work because um, we can start getting into fussing with each other about what do the real numbers look like, but the reality is we know there's almost 8 billion people in the world. The world is changing, it's shifting. We we're sort of, as a people, uh, I'm hoping getting sick of the status quo that we're living with, and we really want to do better. And so how do you create, really create resilient communities, Maylin? So um, this is the insight we got from working in Puerto Rico, um, which is that, in fact, these tests, these disasters, a part of what is necessary to create resilience. Uh, a, a, a happy, fat, fat and happy place where nothing ever happens, you're not going to develop the muscles to respond. And that's actually one thing I want to say about access and inclusion. It's not a nice to have. People we have been excluding have the muscles because they've had to work harder in order to survive in a world that wasn't designed for them. And I'm speaking here as a woman. <laughs> uh, so we actually want to shift the frame to say, okay, we're victims, we're, we're overwhelmed, how are we going to get out of this? When will help come? Is the Messiah on its way, his way, or her way? Uh, it's, that is not going to take us anywhere sitting asking for help. The cavalry is not coming. Now what? And that's what we realize, that we have to show that those people who are saying, pay attention to us, 
No, we should pay attention to ourselves and gather and collectivize and take action. Um, that is the only way we're going to get out. Puerto Rico is a particularly um, salient case because as a U.S. territory, they lost their sense of independence and became dependent on food stamps. When you go to San Juan, you see McDonald's everywhere and um, fast food places. They used to be 80% self-sufficient in food. They're now 4%. This is a terrible thing that has happened. And so having lots of money and lots of help actually makes things worse. And I'm not saying that money isn't important, but using the money for things that strengthen you, not cause you to sit around like a couch potato watching TV, is, is critically important. And so we have to take these tests, the hurricanes around Puerto Rico and the Caribbean, the fires in California are really raising the reality that we're living in a world that is not as under control as we thought it was. <laughs> yeah, I think we're seeing that a lot. We're not in the, the, the volcanoes in Guatemala and Hawaii and other countries. And uh, yeah, and I, I want to turn the mic over to Antonio, but before I do, I know that you created this report and there was still time to uh, review it and do comments. Uh, when is the comment period over? And then, uh, Antonio, I'm sending the mic over to you. <laughs> Actually, the comment period was over August 3rd. It was about a two to three week uh, comment period. Um, we finished our work in the middle of June. We, we were wonderfully surprised about the, the final report because we were one of eight or nine groups and it was beautifully integrated into a narrative that um, for us hung together very well. And we delighted to see that our digital um, layer actually spread all the way through it because we have the technology, we have the tools, why don't we use it to integrate all of these different transportation, energy, health, education, they're no longer silos. We look at things as a community, and then we can come up with new kinds of ways to be, build resilient communities. I want to just actually give one example. Um, the idea of local mesh networks and local electricity generation, um, these are things that you can create skills in the local community to operate. So, you know, when things go down and things don't work, you're not calling for help, you just know what to do. And that brings me back to, if we want to go beyond having a voice, we have to develop the skills required to be actors in this world. And in fact, what we're saying is that the potential for Puerto Rico is to create the skill development for resilient communities by themselves lifting themselves up by the bootstrap and then they can become a resilient community industry hub that people, the, you think of it, why wouldn't you want a sandbox for resilient communities to be in a place that gets swept by hurricanes every year? You do, because they're going to be more resilient. And each year, as they start to take charge of their fate, they can develop better and new tools and approaches and know what they need to learn, what they need to coordinate. We need to know how to get people to safe places. We need to know where they are. How do we have ways to do this? Um, and so the, um, the crisis is generating the muscles and the response that we need to start to have in the digital world. A digital world isn't about everything's fine, what are the gadgets we need to have fun with? No, a digital world is really how do we thrive? And that's thriving in life as it is, not in some kind of bubble or filter or protected place. And thriving is not just people, it's the planet, because that's where we live. So, so I think... Um, you can look at it as a terrible disaster and a crisis, but you can also look at it as the wake up call that we've been needing to get digital technology to support us in the way that improves lives. 
Antonio. Uh, about to the question, but but then in the, in the last, I realized that you know, uh, based on your last comments, that I sh I should change it uh, to, <laughs> to, try to, to, to try to understand try to understand something is now you are talking about building re re resilience in Puerto Rico in the communities. Okay, uh, are you you think that you are building re resilience or you are trying to recover? Uh, that once lost resilience that was somehow lost in let's say the last 20 30 years yeah um uh i think i wouldn't we are all born resilient we have a, a, a drive to survive that if we didn't have we wouldn't be alive but that can get dampened and pushed down by people who want to control us, who want to take away our sense of agency and empowerment. And whether it was intentional or not, that happened in Puerto Rico. They had no representative in Congress, no voting. So they, they just sort of got shuffled off to the side. They do have an observer representative, but they, so, so they just kind of got ignored. And when, when I say that we actually need to um, work out how to respond, you have to recover the sense of, okay, what do I want to do with my life? Like, think about a teenager. A teenager grows up where, you know, the parents are in, in a good home, the parents are providing food and shelter and education and so on. And so they, they, they kind of take it for granted. And some people say, well, you know, how are you going to get out of home? How are you going to leave the nest? How are you going to... And, and, and that's a good question. So people then, for teenagers, say, well, what do you want to do? You know, do you want to be a this or that or other? So, so with resilient communities, we have to bring them back to what is something you want to work for? Just like you would with a teenager. You, you go to a teenager and you say, you want to be a doctor, and they say, I hate the sight of blood. But you think, say, would you like to be a carpenter? And they think, I, that really inspires me. I like to make things with my hands. I mean, there's, you, you need to find out where the passion is, where the, where, where the drive is, where the energy is, and not just for one person, for a com resilient community. The community has to decide what is important to them and then work together to achieve it. It's not the work. It's actually the coming together because we as humans have always needed each other's bright shining eyes and recognition. And so if you can find a goal within a group of people that they share, they can go a long way. And I want to bring us back to, in fact, that's how they get people to fight in wars. It's not that, oh, we want to go and kill the enemy. Oh, no, we want to make you know, this leader, a great leader. No, it's because I depend on my team member and they depend on me. And when it comes to it, I will not let them down. Mm -hmm. And that spirit is what we need to bring back. Because of the lack of tools and information in the past, the only way to sort of move beyond individual kind of uh, pushing forward was to have leaders that said, 10,000 people go off and do this, and, and you know, let's let's go and build the Hoover Dam. And so you just got to do what I tell you to do. Now you have information where people can coordinate and talk to each other and hear each other, and they can come together in teams that are spread around the world about the thing that they care most about to get done. I'll give an example of my own daughter. She is, uh, you know, sort of a creative type. And when she was in high school, she was very lonely. She was very lonely because it, in a high school of 2,000 people, she was so lonely because there weren't people that were kind of off her tribe. But what happened, she was 14 years old. She came to me and said, Mama, that's what she calls me. Um, 
I want to go to a conference. <laughs> I said, okay, where is this conference? It's in LA. What is this that you want to go to? And it was the first YouTube users conference, VidCon. And these lonely people found their tribes on YouTube in a way that um, just changed all of their lives. And, you know, she ended up in this big Harry Potter kind of group that, and they had a, a John Green and um, Hank Green, the Vlog Brothers, that they were the ones who organized VidCon. And they um, really helped young people think about how, what they wanted to do. And you have a sense of agency and power in the world. So I see the ability of the internet to allow people to find their tribe, to allow ourselves to take all of our special talents which are not in the mainstream, come together and get things done. And we, in a way, you know, like I'm a woman, and I'm really, really sick of asking men to pay attention to putting women in leadership. We have to grasp the nettle. We have to take it for ourselves. But we have to be smart about that. We should do it, not in a way where we're trying to push men out, but we should go into places that men aren't, but is needed for humanity. Like, what is the kind of digital home that would allow an elderly person to have a thriving life right up to the day they die, surrounded by friends and relatives in a place that nurtured them right to the end and gave them everything they needed to live and thrive? We are not today driving for digital homes that look like that. Digital homes on the web today look like a man cave. Uh, I will let you draw the natural conclusion. They're man caves designed by men. Uh, they're, absolutely, not, absolutely. they're not taking into account the concerns and the difficulties that people who are sandwiched between looking after children and looking after elders and being concerned about friends or family that are disabled in any way, those voices are not being heard. 7% of all the companies that are being funded are, are led by women. So, so how do we expect that the people who understand those problems are driving this? So I, we have to fund things differently. The current VC model is on is a dinosaur and it's it's on its last legs. The bro culture is being mocked and ridiculed in Hollywood and beyond. And but but we can't just deconstruct. We have to say what we want. And yeah. and I wanna just stop complaining <laughs> and I wanna say what do we want to see and let's gather the people and the skills and capabilities and get it done. Okay, so um, that's a lot to take in. So firstly, I've got a comment on on some of the stuff you said before, which is uh, around the whole idea of fragility, because the internet as designed was designed to be robust, right? So the, the, the core foundations of the internet were designed to have fail safes and to root round problems because that was designed by DARPA where you know the underlying you know core of it was designed as you know to to be resilient to to re resist disasters and to stay working what we've done as we've invited or businesses have invited themselves into the internet space and the, the world wide web space is introduce stuff that is much more fragile so we've now got fragility built upon this really resilient infrastructure where you've got all of these sort of shiny things but essentially as soon as you take away connectivity it all collapses so so we we do need to find like you're talking about with mesh networks ways for uh, things to be much more um, resilient uh, and to be uh, self-supporting that's both in terms of infrastructure and people I think that you're absolutely right. We do need to be looking at how we um, 
as communities build stuff together and that doesn't mean necessarily geographically located that's one of the joys of the internet it's one of the joys of uh the community we've built around access chat is that uh, we've built a community around a cause and around uh, something that we all believe in how do we then sort of relate the idea to to the stuff that's happening at a at a global level can we um, for example, get World Economic Forum and uh, engaged in real change rather than talking about change. Uh, they're doing a fantastic job on social media, by the way. The, the, the campaigns that they're running are really good and they're engaging. But uh, I know, for example, our friend Caroline Casey is, is wanting to energize the conversation around disability. Um, and have a moment a bit like the moment that the lgbt community had when they um really engaged global leadership on their topic so um how do we how do we do that for disability and how do we do that for inclusion in general and 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 as you say is it through top-down leadership getting the, the the bros in the suits to do it or is it or are there other ways? So is World Economic Forum the right place to do it? I think that, that we have a hierarchy, we have this structure, we're not going to overturn that overnight unless we want revolution. And I personally think that they tend to be violent and, you know, there are, there are pros and cons to things like that. You may say it's a tumultuous event, it's a hurricane blowing through, but... Uh, Maybe not. So I, I, I've asked a lot of questions there. So I am going to start with what you said at the beginning. And then if I, if I don't address some of the other things, you should remind me. Um, OK. It, I, it's actually a misnomer to say that the uh, Internet wasn't designed in a way that is more robust. Uh, because, in fact, I had the privilege of working with the two men at the labs in UCLA and SRI for the first two nodes of the internet. So Vince Cerf is who I'm working with now, but I was sure. the chair of the core planning committee for Douglas Engelbart. And Douglas Engelbart spent his entire life from the moment he came up with this concept that it's essential that we have community because he was so clear that the internet would be powerful that if we left it in the hands of individuals, it would corrupt absolutely. And we're seeing that now. But he came up with the mouse, with the idea that in fact it provides a platform for multiple mice to be on the screen at the same time. That was lost because people were so blown away that you could actually have a screen. But in fact, his whole idea is that we have to have networks of communities in parallel with the internet. But it isn't enough to just have networks. They have to be doing something. A network just sort of sitting there like a lump is not going to drive action. The idea of improvement, of using improvement science, about having hypothesis about how the world works, about testing that hypothesis, about driving change and learning one over and over again what works, what doesn't work in individual communities is so much more incredibly powerful if those communities are networked because one breakthrough can then be propagated through the network. So if you look at what has happened in business, it's almost like a network improvement community in that individual businesses can be considered community. And then uh, a business makes a breakthrough, uh, like how to build a train or how to do a printing press or how to build an Apple iPhone. And then that gets propagated through and it, 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 it gets copied. There's other people that do that kind of thing. And so that business itself is an example of a networked improvement community. We should be thinking about how to use network improvement communities beyond business for social impact. Now, social impact lacks 
quantitative measures. Business was only able to start to get investment when they started to have accounting standardized in such a way that funders could see, okay, how do I measure what they've done compared to somebody else? And then you could say, okay, I'm gonna invest in the best ones, the operating, the ones who are delivering. And who's delivering? Well, you have to count. So the stock exchange and accounting came together to allow businesses to be funded um, outside of sort of grants and family money. Today, that was 160 years ago in Belgium, the first stock exchange. We're still operating like that. 10Ks, quarterly reports, things that were inspired by a model of paper and pencil and abacus or, you know, mental arithmetic. Um, we've come a long way. We have Internet of Things. We can track 24 by 7 by, um, by, by the second and by the millisecond. We can find out what's working, what's not working in an instant. We need the idea of a project exchange so that all kinds of projects could actually be measured in a more systematic way. But if we want social impact to be um, now come to the forefront, we can use something that's already been developed, which is the Sustainable Development Goals. The, the UN it took two years to create the Sustainable Development Goals with 169 subcategories. And so we've actually got a framework of measuring progress. We haven't got very clear measures, but we can start. And certainly for poverty, which is the goal number one, you can measure that. How much income do people have? How are we making progress uh, against that? So what I've been um, suggesting is that we need to use the tools we have to work out how to count progress to go towards the goals that we want to have. Because only when we start counting can we then bring the financiers in. It's not that they don't care it's just that if you if they they're counting people and you don't give them stuff to count, they're not gonna they're gonna stay where the numbers are. I had a very sad experience about economics. I, I go I used to go quite regularly to an international economics gathering done by the University of Santa Cruz. It was the one in two thousand and eight, <laughs> before just before the crisis, and all the topics were about how you know. I made this great breakthrough because I have a mathematical algorithm for foreign exchange currency things. And then I realized, oh, but that's, oh they're, they're working on that because that's where the data is. And then like two months later, the global financial crisis happened. And that was not at all talked about that the whole world of economics was like on this Oh, to write my thesis, I have to look at foreign exchange because that's where the numbers are. And they're ignoring this huge part, which is people's lives and the threat that was happening with the kind of the crisis where people were investing in things that they didn't know what, what was going on. People weren't invest, investigating that. We, only after that did they start to kind of track the numbers into it. So I think I would suggest LGBT, deaf, we need to put numbers into this. Once we start to put numbers, then people can start to say, okay, I want to see who's actually making a difference. And then I, I want to help them do more. And that's the idea of a networked improvement community that we start to have, you know, I, I, I'll just call it leaderboards. Who's, who's getting it done? <laughs> okay, yeah, that's, a, that's a, obviously we need to, um, there's a finite amount of money. So uh, we need to invest in the people that are going to bring about the results. And I think that sustainable development goals is one good way to measure. And thankfully, aside from poverty, there's also measurements in there around disability as well. So that's, that's important. Um, I, I think that there's still more that can be done. As you say, they, there's 
you know, the, the honing and refining of, of those kind of measurements, but let's get started. Um, we're at the end of our half hour. It's gone way too quickly. Um, so I just need to thank uh, Barclays and my clear text for their support, um, because without support from our community, we wouldn't be sustainable. Um, we've, we've managed um, four, four years so far coming up to, about to start our fifth year. So uh, thank you for every for, to everyone for that support. Melin, it's, it's been a pleasure as always. We look forward to you joining us on Twitter um, because I think it's going to be a really fascinating discussion. Thank you once again. Great, thank, thank you. you.